僕の残白と強化水月有する能力は完全催眠だよく言うよ呪霊の分際で Kings of manipulation and trickery Kenjaku and Aizen are perhaps some of the most intelligent shonen characters we have ever seen but one question will always come up when we talk about these two who is truly smarter Hello everyone, my name is Kirst, and today we're going to be answering one of anime's most difficult questions. Who is truly Shonen's most intelligent character? At first glance, Kenjaku just seems like your typical villain in the shadows type character. However, even this plays into the absolute galaxy brain that lies within Kenjaku. Over 2000 years old, Kenjaku has been manipulating people since even before the golden age of Jujutsu sorcery and has only gotten more cunning as time has progressed. At the start of the series, Kenjaku is shown to instantly be orchestrating events such as planting Sukuna's finger at his son Yuji Itadori's school. Predicting that the curses he released would overpower Megumi, and further predicting that Yuji would try to save him by consuming the finger, thereby becoming Sukuna's vessel and starting the plot. Kenjaku then goes on to manipulate events further by planting another finger at the detention center, where Yuji is defeated by the special grade cursed wound and almost killed. However, he is saved by Sukuna, who defeats the curse and displays his power, which is what Kenjaku's original intention was. Kenjaku continues to display his complex understanding of those around him, as without even being near Yuji's corpse after Sukuna had ripped out his heart, knew Yuji would be revived by Sukuna, which is insane. Because even Sukuna did not know he would be reviving Yuji until after he had died. This shows the absolute understanding Kenjaku has of those around him, as just from this understanding of Yuji and Sukuna, he's able to perfectly predict how both would act, even while he's in the process of manipulating others, such as Jogo and Disaster Curse. After Jogo displays his wildcard nature to Kenjaku, Kenjaku instantly begins manipulating him and convincing him that he is stronger than he actually is. And through this, he baits Jogo into facing Gojo Satoru, the strongest sorcerer and someone Jogo had no chance of defeating. Kenjaku knew this and accepted Jogo's deal that if he could defeat Gojo, he would hand over the prison realm. Kenjaku desired Jogo's curse technique, so we know he had no intention of letting Jogo die. Something interesting about all of this is how Kenjaku goes about saving Jogo though. Kenjaku tells Jogo before this that at best Jogo could run away from Gojo with all the disaster curses helping him. But here comes Kenjaku, who in just a couple of words convinces Hanami to save Jogo, perfectly timed after Gojo's domain had ended, where he could not use his curse any for a couple of moments. With the knowledge that Kenjaku had no intention of letting Jogo die to begin with, this heavily implies that Kenjaku knew. Gojo would open his domain expansion and knew Hanami would be able to save Jogo without dying to Gojo himself in this time. This whole plan was created moments after Jogo displays once that he would be difficult to control, as the meeting in the restaurant seemed to be a very recent thing with Jogo, since Kenjaku had not even met Mahito at this time, it seemed, although not much changes if he did. All this means Kenjaku was able to create multi step plans that involved manipulating multiple people, some of which he had only recently met and knew very little about, at the drop of a hat, which is an absolutely crazy feat. These plans work too, as after this point, Jogo becomes much more obedient to Kenjaku's plans. Kenjaku's crazy Sharingan level precog continues though, as just upon seeing his son Yuji with a child named Junpei, he hits a jackpot, which heavily implies as soon as he saw Junpei, he'd created an outcome to a plan in his mind, which is confirmed later on. And we see after this that he is able to meticulously orchestrate events in such a way where his son Yuji grows in strength, Mahito evolves his curse technique, which is important for later, and Receives the Jujutsu College into collecting Ryom and Suk in his fingers. Kenjaku himself even says that this entire plan was set into motion the literal moment he saw Junpei, and Kenjaku was certain it would play out the way it did, as he makes it clear he's not a fan of taking risks. This can all be a little complex though. So, something easier to grasp to understand how intelligent Kenjaku is is that Aoi Todo, a man who can have an entire conversation in his head and understand an enemy's curse technique in the same time, has an IQ of 540,000, 54,000, and some other translations. Todo has an unimaginable intellect and is smarter than anyone we have ever known, and yet gets 
perfectly manipulated along with the rest of the verse by Kenjaku as no one in the entire school was able to grasp the true intentions behind the Hanami invasion or that Mekamaru was working with Kenjaku which is implied Kenjaku had convinced him to do. Mekamaru by the way is implied to love Kasumi Miwa and yet could have potentially gotten her killed by working with Kenjaku which goes to show that Kenjaku was able to convince someone to betray not only their friends but their loved ones too although once Mekamaru finds out that the Kyoto school had been hurt in this deal he turns on Kenjaku however Kenjaku had already gotten what he needed by this time. Moving on to one of the more impressive feats for Kenjaku is when he was able to completely and accurately determine exactly what Ryomansukuna's plans were without even seeing him do anything. Sukuna had remained dormant within Yuji and was biding his time. However, Kenjaku was able to not only figure out that Sukuna was after something, but was able to determine that it was a person and who that person was, although only in a general sense. This is actually a broken feat Ken was able to figure out Sukuna's plans solely based off of his actions and how they did not align with his own expectations, meaning that defying Kenjaku's plans may actually only just make them even more accurate. Elaborating on some of Kenjaku's past may help to explain this immeasurable intellect. Kenjaku has been exploring cursed energy for thousands of years, to the point that he had nothing left to learn. He completely understands his own universe's power systems and the people in it, to the point that he thinks that literally nothing is outside of his ability to manipulate, even going as far as to improve his own versus power systems solely so he can create a chaos that he himself cannot manipulate. To put this differently, imagine Orochimaru was able to manipulate everyone in Naruto so easily and knew so much about chakra and jutsu that he sought out to improve the fundamental nature of chakra and jutsu and make everyone in his verse stronger solely so he could create something which he could no longer manipulate. Moving on to Kenjaku's most impressive feat, however, is his actions during the Shibuya incident arc of Jujutsu Kaisen. In this arc, Ken had created a plan to steal Gojo Satoru, the strongest sorcerer of the modern era. Ken created a plan in which he could place a mental strain on Gojo and perfectly target his weaknesses by manipulating his emotions and morals. Kenjaku set up a situation that perfectly countered Satoru Gojo and forced him to basically just stand around doing nothing. Gojo was unable to kill the curses that were much, much weaker than himself for around 20 minutes due to the sheer depth of Kenjaku's plans. These same plans were considered impossible by Jogo, who thought it was basically a death sentence. However, not only does Kenjaku convince Jogo to go through with the plan anyway, but he succeeds in the plan too. Kenjaku was able to keep Satoru Gojo within a 4 meter radius for 60 seconds straight by perfectly ordering a certain series of events, first being his surprise at the prison realm, and then his surprise at seeing his dead best friend again. Gojo perceives time a little differently to everyone else. A moment for us is a minute for him. However, Kenjaku was able to perfectly account for this and easily seal Gojo without ever throwing a single attack himself. To go with another Naruto example, it's a bit like Kabuto sealing Kaguya without ever even casting a jutsu. Gojo's six eyes were even stated to reject all possibilities and yet he was still completely unable to recognize Kenjaku's plan. Kenjaku himself even stated that he had desired these exact circumstances, meaning that everything had gone exactly as he wanted it. Later on, Kenjaku even manipulates Mahito and Yuji into facing off once more to evolve Mahito's technique to its seeming limit before absorbing Mahito at his weakest point and taking his technique, something that seemed almost effortless, and then continues to start educating Yuji on Jujutsu's sorcery like he knew it off by heart. Needless to say, Kenjaku is incredibly Incredibly intelligent, but how does he stack up against Aizen from Bleach? I'm joined by my friend Stryker, who can give some more insight into Aizen. Howdy people, I'm Stryker. Valor wanted someone a bit more familiar with Bleach to talk about Aizen, so here I am in all my endless glory. Aizen is certainly one of the smartest characters in Shonen history when it comes to long-term planning. He shows excellency in understanding the history of the Soul Society, including some of the most obscure information, like knowing what the key to the Soul King's palace is and how to create one. While posing as a captain, he worked extensively on the development of Hollow and Shinigami powers to create numerous Arankar, which notably includes the members of the Espada and special entities like Wonderwise. An Arankar whose whole existence is centered around countering Yamamoto's Bankai. It should go without saying that Aizen playing 40 chess with Ichigo's entire life is the greatest showing of his brilliance. His work on developing Ichigo is essentially the accumulation of all of his research, planning, and manipulation. When Ichigo pulls up to fake Karakura Town, Aizen reveals his involvement in Ichigo's growth throughout his journey. He first talks about how he had anticipated Ichigo to be as strong as he was, and that he foresaw the numerous events that would make Ichigo grow in strength. Starting with the event that started the series, which was Ichigo meeting Rukia, where we see Ichigo tap into Soul Reaper 
powers for the first time. Aizen then references Ichigo's battle with Uryu, where he fights a Menos Grande Hollow and further awakens his Soul Reaper powers. Following this, Aizen talks about fights Ichigo had with Renji, Kenpachi, and Byakuya in the Soul Society, along with the lessons he learned from those fights when it came to developing his Anpakuto and his Hollowfication. He ends this summary of Ichigo's fights by talking about the two big fights he had in Hueco Mundo, which were against Grimjia and Ukiora. Aizen notes how Ichigo mastered holification against Grimjiao and that he acquired an even greater power in the fight against Ukiora, which is a very obvious reference to the awakening of Vassal Lord Ichigo. Aizen then tells Ichigo how all the battles he experienced were all in the palm of his hand. And after Ichigo questions this, we see Aizen detail some oddities with some of the things Ichigo has experienced in his life, like how he coincidentally sees a hollow for the first time after his encounter with Rukia. This conversation spans across two chapters and these two chapters alone hammer down how much Aizen manipulated Ichigo. And it gets way worse when you consider every single character that was involved in the madness. So for this reason, I came up with four different elements to compare the two. Starting with the first, what was their goal and did they accomplish it? Aizen arguably had two goals. The first one was to break into the Soul King's palace and take the place of the Soul King. This goal is driven by Aizen's dislike of following the status quo, and his belief that brilliant people such as himself and Kisuke Arahara should be questioning how the world should be as opposed to how the world is. Obviously, Aizen failed in this goal, but this was due to interference from Ichigo, who became his rival in raw power, and Kisuke, who is his rival in intellect. The second goal is a bit more speculatory since this literally comes from Ichigo's speculation, so take this with a grain of salt if you so choose. After Kisuke uses Akito to make the Hogyoku reject Aizen, Ichigo questions if that really happened and proposes the idea that since the Hogyoku can read into your heart and grant your wishes that Aizen may have wanted to lose his powers. Ichigo then describes the loneliness he felt from Aizen's sword and says that since Aizen was born with exceptional powers, he may have just wanted to meet someone who could see things from his perspective, and that once Aizen gave up on that idea, a part of his heart started wishing he could be a weaker soul reaper. If what Ichigo ponders here is true, then Aizen's second goal is to meet someone on his level so that they can see things the way he sees things. Unfortunately, Aizen absolutely failed in this aspect as well. Not only does Ichigo, someone who he allowed to reach his level in terms of power, never tap into a similar mentality of defying the status quo, but Kisuke, his intellectual rival, also didn't see things from his point of view either. After Kisuke explains the need of the Soul King and the necessity of order, Aizen outright calls out that logic as the logic of a loser which should show how much he dislikes that way of thinking. We've yet to see if Kenjaku will succeed in his goal, but from what we know so far, it's not exactly important if he does or not. To understand what I'm getting at here, let me explain. Kenjaku's plan is to force the optimization of cursed energy, and he plans on doing so by making everyone in Japan a Jujutsu Sorcerer. As Valor mentioned earlier, Kenjaku understands cursed energy to the point that in order to truly see this power optimized to the fullest, he needs to create a chaos that he cannot control. Kenjaku even mentions how he originally tried to bring forth the evolution of cursed energy in himself, but that didn't work. On a deeper level, this man understands that as long as he continues to exist, he technically serves as the limitation of cursed energy. He has lived a very long life where he was able to manipulate the world around him for his own purposes. To break this cycle and to truly have cursed energy progress, he needs to force the emergence of something that will finally put an end to him despite all of his tactics. With this in mind, the deadlock Kenjaku is stuck in has it so he either cannot succeed because he is too brilliant, or is so brilliant that only he could create something greater than himself. This is why I'd give the point for this element to Kenjaku. The next element is simply how long they were planning for or working towards their goal. This is a very simple point to give to Kenjaku. Aizen at best has been around the Soul Society for a bit over a hundred years, while Kenjaku has been scheming around for thousands of years. Kenjaku would have obviously spent way more time manipulating way more people than Aizen if he's been scheming for way longer, so I doubt I need to go any further with this. The third element is what assistance did they receive for their goal. It's not exactly the fact that they had help that's relevant for these two since they were the brains for their respective groups. It's more so how their relationships with those entities affected or could have affected them negatively. For Kenjaku's case, he mainly worked with the disaster curses so he could use their assistance to seal Satoru Gojo. Along with that, he also wanted to further develop Mahito's powers so he could absorb his technique when it was at its peak. While he didn't seem to care that much about Diagon and Hanami's abilities, he obviously needed Mahito's for his current scheme, and he even wanted to acquire Jogo's ability as well. Only Mahito seemed to have some level of distrust for him, and when he eventually confirmed his suspicions, it was far too late to try anything worthwhile to fight back. Ultimately, Kenjaku gained a lot and lost very little. Aizen is very similar to this with his two main henchmen. Tosin was a, no pun intended, blind follower of Aizen and obviously maintained loyalty to him. 
while Gein never actually trusted Aizen at all and wanted to kill him the entire time. I want to highlight Gein because Aizen makes a very bad mistake with Gein that almost cost him everything he worked for. As we all know, Gein nearly kills Aizen with the true nature of his Bankai ability, and had it not been for the Hogyoku finalizing his connection to Aizen, this arc would have been over at this point. The fact that Aizen even allowed this to happen is a big shortcoming on his end, which he only did let happen for the sake of curiosity and nothing else. He had no real contingency plan for this and only got past Gein due to luck really. While Aizen ultimately gained a lot and lost little, he took a very serious risk by not having any plan set for a variable he was choosing to ignore. Yet another point for Kenjaku. The final element I have here is did any special abilities play a huge factor in accomplishing their goal? Once again, I feel like the importance of this is obvious. As an example, if I could manipulate someone into doing what I want through sheer rhetorical skill, it would be a way more impressive feat than if I manipulated that person using a mind hacks ability. In the case of these two geniuses, the special abilities that would be at play would be Kenjaku's curse technique which lets him take over other people's bodies, and Aizen's Kyoko Soigetsu which manipulates the five senses to create illusions. Kenjaku's ability lets him use other people's bodies as his own and use their curse technique. Choso alludes to the idea that this technique allows for Kenjaku to extend his lifespan which would make a lot of sense. With this in mind, you can say a very big reason Kenjaku reached as far as he did was due to this ability. However, this doesn't nullify his feats of manipulation on most of the cast. For example, Kenjaku posing as Ghetto only had a big impact on Gojo and that was in just one scene. Kenjaku still had to plan and manipulate for the prison realm scheme to work in the first place. With characters like the disaster curses, his current body doesn't exactly give him more of an advantage when trying to manipulate them since obviously none of them have any connection to Ghetto. Kenjaku's relationship with Kashimo even suggests that he wasn't completely deceptive of his identity and plans throughout all these years. Not only does Kashimo know his real name, but he also knows enough about his plans to know that he would receive a platform to fight Ryom and Sukuna by working with Kenjaku. Aizen, on the other hand, is implied to not be carried by Kyoko Soigetsu that much. In the few fights Aizen has, he doesn't even use Kyoko Soigetsu's special ability that much, and we learn that the Espada only follow Aizen because of his raw power as opposed to his illusions. Since while Kenjaku does have to put in a lot of work despite his ability, I think it carries him a lot more than Aizen is carried by his illusions. At this point, you could probably tell our conclusion, and that is that Kenjaku is way smarter than Aizen. While Aizen is one of the best there is when it comes to intellect and Shonen, Kenjaku simply does it better, and we've yet to see the fullest extent of this manipulation over sorcerers. Valor has granted me the honor of doing the outro, so if you like what you saw, be sure to like and subscribe for more JJK videos. I would personally recommend his recent Hikari and Yuta videos, since I think those are really good. If you want more of me, be sure to check out my TikTok. I mostly do power scaling related content for numerous video games and manga verses I'm into, which of course includes JJK and Bleach. Now with all of that out of the way, I would like to say thank you for watching, and have a wonderful day.